Hello, boys and girls and everyone else, and uh, welcome to Knitting Time with Willie, the show where you spend time with me, Willie, while I knit. And, and usually there's, there's someone else here to talk to me to keep it more interesting, but not today. Actually, that's not true. As always, I'm joined by my co-host, Nicholas. Uh, but I'm not doing my usual interview today because I wanted to try something a little bit different. I've, I've been giving it a lot of thought and instead of my normal routine, I want to talk about something very near and dear to my heart. I'm talking, of course, about cycle six of the mid 2000s reality television show, America's Next Top Model. I, I, I don't know, I don't know why I built it up like that. You knew what I was going to say because you read the title card. I just roll the title. Right now, a lot of you are probably asking a lot of questions, you know, like, why America's Next Top Model? What does this have to do with knitting? Uh, why are you doing this? Who are you? Why did the algorithm think I would like this shit? And, what does that say about me as a person? And you know, these are all good questions and I don't know that I have the answers to any of them, except for one, I can tell you why I'm doing it. If you know me, you know that I don't like to bring up pandemic in my videos a lot because, well, my comedy is timeless. That said, this thing has been going on long enough that it's honestly hard to talk about anything else. So if you're watching this in the year 2400, as I assume many of you are, just know that the pandemic was this thing that happened in 2020 and 2021 that caused us all a whole lot of stress and sucked really, really bad. These past eight years of pandemic have been really hard on all of us. And a lot of us coped with it by revisiting a lot of our favorite pieces of media for comfort. I personally went back and pulled out literally anything I could do to make me forget about the fact that, you know, the world is crumbling around us. Movies, TV, cartoons, not books, but certainly music. Literally anything I could do to fill the void of time between sleep and sleep. As you probably guessed, given that you're watching this video and presumably have basic reasoning skills, one of the things that I dug up was a and And honestly, guys, I'm a little bit surprised that I did. Don't get me wrong, I definitely was a fan of it when I was a kid, but I didn't think of it as one of my favorites. Of course, then I binged the entire series in the span of, of a day, and I can confirm that it is one of the best shows of all time, and a show that left a much bigger mark on me than I realized. It's probably not a great thing to say that this show played a huge role in shaping who I am today, but re-watching it, like it totally did. Don't get me wrong. I loved it as a kid, but rewatching it now that I can vote, it literally blew my mind. At this point in my life, the only thing I want to do is talk about every square inch of America's Next Top Model. And since most, most of my friends have my number blocked, I decided I wanted to make a series of videos where I broke down every episode and talked about it for ye old YouTube. So that's what I did. And that's what you're watching right now. I know I already played the title card, but this intro has been long and I needed something to break it up. Also, it's about to get a little longer because before we can begin, I have a couple of things I have to say up front first. Disclaimer number one. I have been a problematic person for a very large portion of my life and now I'm trying not to be that, but I'm still kind of bad at it. So uh, I think these videos I'm making definitely are going to need a content warning of some sort, but I'm not entirely sure what exactly the specifics of that would be. I think what I might do going forward is just say content warning 2006. 
And if anything that could have aged poorly in a show about modeling from that time might upset you, then a poorly aged version of that thing is probably in this show about modeling, and it will probably upset you. That said, I don't think the show has aged as bad as its reputation would have you believe. Like, there's a good chance that a lot of you only know this show as a show that has aged poorly, and that kind of makes sense because, like, yeah, it's, it's, it's evil. It's, it's evil, you know, but it's not, like, that evil. It's like normal amounts of evil, if that makes sense. Still, there is a lot of stuff in here that might be upsetting to you. And if anyone in the comments wants to provide a more proper content warning, please do so and I will do my best to pin it so that people can know what they're in for. Disclaimer number two. There's no, there's no chance that that didn't peak my audio. I'm probably going to say some stuff about people on this show that may not always be the nicest. I will try not to be actively mean because I know that these are real people, but if for some reason I say something that seems too harsh, just know that as far as I'm concerned, these aren't real people. Wait, wait, that sounded meaner. Let, let, let me explain. What I mean is that what we are seeing are very young women being filmed in extremely strange circumstances that are probably going to make anyone act a little bit weird. On top of all of that, this happened in 2006, so even if what we're seeing is an entirely accurate representation of them as people, who's to say they're even the same person anymore? Obviously, if they did something truly horrible, saying it was 2006 is not an excuse, but I don't think that any of the contestants do anything that bad. Like, at their worst, maybe they're a little shitty to one another, but they're not, like, stabbing each other. There's a solid chance that some of them would, maybe, but none of them do, and that's what matters. Also, not for nothing, but the oldest contestant here is, like, 26, which, like, if we were all judged by things we did when we were in our early 20s, I'd still be on the no-fly list. Like, take this one girl, for example, who spends her entire time on the show crying because she misses her parents. And bear in mind that she's gone for like a total of 72 hours. My mom is my best friend. My dad is my hero. Every time I think of them, I can't help but cry because I know how much they support me in this. Clearly that is not a fully formed human being. This is all to say that I am viewing this show as a text, and these contestants are characters in that text. They are very highly based on real people, sure, but I am not looking at them in that way. Think of it like this. I don't judge Adam Driver for the mean things that Kylo Ren does. I judge him because he looks like he eats whole chickens with his bare hands, and that scares me. So yes, I may be saying some mean things about these people, but I don't mean it personally, and if that's not your thing, maybe watch one of my other videos, which maybe the algorithm is put somewhere right here, I don't know. But yes, that's all I had to say up front, and with that stuff out of the way, let's get started talking about America's Next Top Model, Cycle 6, Episode 1, shall we? So for those of you who don't know what America's Next Top Model is, why don't I just have the show tell you for itself? America's Next Top Model is not just about beauty. It's a journey of transformation. And our winners have transformed into working models that are working. So that clears that up. I think maybe what she meant to say was working models who are working it. I don't know, it's, it's a weird flex to say. A better name for this show might be America's Next Top Tyra because it's really more of a mentoring program where supermodel Tyra Banks teaches girls how to be Tyra and then selects the girl who best represents Tyra. Like almost like it's like Tyra Banks' version of Willy Wonka taking people on a tour of the chocolate factory looking for her own replacement, but uh, it feels like like way more of a fever dream. 
So the first episode is actually a casting episode. Ultimately, there are going to be 12 models who get put inside of a house to compete, and that makes up the bulk of the show. But we actually get to see like 30 models compete for a spot to continue to compete because I guess just a simple non-filmed rejection from the competition would, would, wouldn't be cruel enough. I think what I'm going to do is give you guys a rundown of each of the girls who does make it into the house. And you can use this as sort of like a Rosetta Stone to understand who I'm talking about going forward. So what happens in these casting episodes is that they bring each of the contestants into this like motel multi-purpose room where they ask her a few questions and judge her like a piece of meat. Uh, and then she leaves and the judges say something about her more vicious than anything I've ever said about my worst enemy, but they say it is like, like a compliment. She looks like a praying mantis. So in the fashion world, that could be- That's a good thing. A Ultimately, what they're trying to do is come up with a storyline for each girl. And a storyline in the world of America's Next Top Model is kind of like a cross between like a personality and a goal. Once a girl is, is given a storyline, they are completely defined by it until it reaches its conclusion, at which point they're either eliminated or, or if they're lucky, they win. So, so remember that, and, and, and with that in mind, let's meet the girls, okay? So first girl we meet is Sarah. And Sarah, well, Sarah's actually a little bit boring. That said, she's actually a pretty good starting off point because she's a really clear example of how the show let's say crafts each of the girls storyline because you can tell that they don't really know what they're going to do with her up front so they just try on a bunch of different looks to see what sticks the first option for storylines for sarah is that she's the smart girl they always like to have a smart girl because i think they want to prove that models can be smart and we learn really early on that she went to Georgetown. My name's Sarah, and I'm, I actually just graduated from Georgetown University. So, yeah, that's impressive. But that said, they've had girls on from much better schools in earlier seasons, and there's even a doctor up for casting on this season. So, I guess what I'm saying is maybe get off your fucking high horse, Sarah. The next storyline they toy with giving Sarah is the fact that she's very tall. I guess she's like six foot or something. I think that this is the storyline that the judging panel thinks that the show's gonna go with because they focus on it a lot in their time with her. And uh, that leads to my favorite question ever. How do you feel about being six foot one? What a weird what a what a what a weird question to ask someone i love it so much she goes on to talk about how her height affected her as a kid and how her friends call her glamazon my nickname is glamazon and that's because i am so tall like an amazon woman which is how i think i know that she's a bit of a boring person because the nickname Glamazon is a very impersonal nickname for your friends to give you. Like, I feel like if my friends gave me the nickname Glamazon, I'd be like, come on, guys, dig a little deeper. That's a terrible nickname. Although I guess maybe the nickname Glamazon feels terrible to me because, because I'm not a six foot tall blonde woman. Right now, some of you might be saying something along the lines of being tall doesn't sound like much of a storyline. And to you, I say two things. One, don't you ever interrupt me like that again. And two, they could absolutely stretch that out into many, many episodes. Like if this was the storyline that they went with for Sarah, uh, we'd probably get a lot of shots of her like not fitting into clothes a bunch of times. and. The judges would constantly talk a lot about how she doesn't know how to use her height to her advantage or something like that. How many designers hire models are 6'1"? They'd also probably have one 
judge come out right and say, she's too tall to be a model, that'll never work. And that judge would probably be Janice Dickinson. And then eventually she'd be eliminated. And Tyra would say something like, you stand before me a beautiful girl with a beautiful body. But the judges aren't sure you know how special you truly are. And if you don't know how special you are, how can you expect the fashion industry to know how special you truly are? And then she'd get eliminated. Ultimately, that's not the storyline they go with, though. Instead, they decide that Sarah is the girl who may not want it badly enough, which is an archetype that the show likes to trot out every season to show that you have to have drive in order to be a model. Once they decide on that as her storyline, they do a lot to make her seem wishy-washy and really play up the fact that she didn't audition for the show, but was instead spotted at a mall by a casting agent. Sarah, you didn't have to stand in the line forever for this audition. We found you in a mall and chased you down. Which I guess makes a lot of sense because it was probably super easy for, for the casting agent to spot her because she's so tall, apparently. After Sarah is Feranda, and you may recognize her as the praying mantis from earlier. She looks like a praying mantis. I think Feranda is supposed to be what I'll call the diamond in the rough of the season, and that means that her journey is that she starts off a little bit rough around the edges and grows a whole lot during the course of the competition. The show likes a storyline like this because it shows the importance of growth and persistent. But here's the thing. I don't actually think Feranda is as rough around the edges as the show would make you believe. The things we learn about Feranda are that she lives in what she describes as the boondocks. And she used to work as a phone sex operator, which the show, of course, makes her demonstrate. Yeah, mm -hmm. I just came from over there, and me and my homegirls was chilling and stuff. Oh, God. <laughs> hey, how are you? Other than that, though, she just seems like a smart, funny, level-headed young woman, and I think that's because she is a smart, funny, level-headed young woman. Honestly, the only negative thing I would say about her is that I would probably want my money back if I called her phone sex line. And, and got her dominatrix character. Why are you calling? What do you want? Veranda does a 180 and acts a little cuckoo bananas in the next couple of episodes in the house, and I have a conspiracy theory that the producers were like whispering in her ear to try and make her act that way because they wanted to have an underdog story and they thought it would be easier to like break down someone who's already a little bit together rather than like pick a true diamond in the rough and like hope that she gets her shit together before the before the end of the season. Of course, like I said, that's just a conspiracy theory, and it's at this moment that I should probably make it clear that nothing I'm saying in these videos are fact, and uh, I'm basically just that it's always sunny in Philadelphia meme where Charlie's like putting uh, strings together. After Feranda, we meet Carrie, but we'll skip her for now, and instead, we'll talk about Wendy, because Wendy is way more interesting. Wendy is what I would call the promo girl, which is someone who has the story or hook that sounds really good in a soundbite. Like, they like to be able to say, this season has a girl who is blank, and that blank is usually something juicy or, or interesting that will give people a reason to tune in. And uh, in Wendy's case, that sentence goes, this season has a girl who recently survived the tragedy of Hurricane Katrina. And keep in mind that this was filmed in 2005 when Katrina, like, had just happened. Literally, at this point, she does not know where her family is and her house was just destroyed. Uh, but they still decided to not only film her as a contestant, but make sure that she can't make it through a scene without the worst tragedy of her life being brought up in some way for, for our own entertainment. Like, literally, this is how Tyra greets her in casting. My name is Wendy. I'm 22 and from New Orleans, Louisiana. New Orleans? Yes. Okay, I want to ask you about Hurricane Katrina. Like, Jesus, Tyra, let a girl breathe. Wendy is in a strong competitor, and I think that's because she's probably in the early stages of, of PTSD. I'm still in shock that I'm here. Uh, I think she goes home second. Which, yeah, it makes sense. Not knowing where your family is is, is probably going to take your head out of the game a little bit. 
Earlier, I called the show evil, and I truly think that her presence on the show is the most evil aspect of the season. Because, like, in a perfect world, I feel like they would give her, like, this voucher and be like, here's a voucher, go go make sure your family is safe, and then come back and redeem it to be on the next season. Of course, they probably wouldn't want her to take the time, because the producers are only interested in her competing now while the wound is still fresh, and you can tell that that's the case. Because uh, Tyra explicitly says that it's not the case. Wendy. <laughs> One thing that I want to tell you, you're standing over there because you have a really great personality and a lot of modeling potential. It's no pity party here. I don't know. I don't want to sound harsh, but clearly the producers of this show are horrible emotional vampires who want to capitalize on tragedy and feast on the despair that it brings. All right, though, let's move on from tragedy and talk about something that makes me happier than literally anything that has ever existed, and that is the next contestant. Her name is Jade, and I love her. I'm so excited to be here. We're like eight hours into this video at this point, and uh, some of you Eagle Eye viewers might be wondering why I decided to start at season six of a television show and talk about it from there. And there are two reasons. The first is that I think that season six is kind of like the platonic ideal of what an ANTM season should be. Like it's arguably not the best one, but I feel like it is the clearest example of what the show's creators were going for. Uh, and the second is Jade. I, I've never seen Breaking Bad, so while I know that a lot of people are very into Walter White. I feel pretty confident that uh, actually it's Jade who's the best, most complex character to ever exist on television. People think I'm a bitch when they first meet me because oh, I'm pretty, I have this beautiful body, but when they get to know me, I'm so cool, I'm very real. Ostensibly, her storyline is that she's the villain of the season, but I personally don't look at her that way. Like, I, I don't know. Like, if I'm watching a gladiator movie, I don't think of the lions as the villains so much as the emperor who released them into the Colosseum. And in that same vein, I feel like it's more the producers who are the villain of the season, and Jade is just this beautiful, glorious lioness doing exactly what she's supposed to. Because it's, it's her nature. Every time I walk down the street, I, I mean, heads are like turning, like, look at this. People know. They know Jade. They know my face. Literally everything Jade does is fascinating to me. Like, the first time we meet her is in this video collage of, like, a bunch of girls. And she's just riding this dog on a skateboard. And I shit you not that I have watched that, like, 80 times filming this just to try and figure out what the hell is going on there. Her big thing is to talk about how humble she is. Everybody thinks I'm very down to earth. I have this style, I'm very cool. Of course she is not. And you know, I'm very intimidating to a lot of these girls. I don't know, she is just like this kind of perfect storm of confidence and obliviousness that is perfect for reality television. She just kind of blows into a room and takes control and I don't even think I can properly convey in words how much I love her. After Jade is Gina, and I don't know if I would call Gina a contestant so much as like, I don't know, if you go to a pet store and you buy a snake and a mouse, I don't think you would call the mouse a pet. And like in that same vein, Gina is just kind of this small creature that the producers wanted to put into a small cage so that they could watch as she was, as she was swallowed whole. In, in this metaphor, of course, Jade, Jade is the snake. She, she picks on Gina a lot. Gina's interview with the judges does not go well. Like, she contradicts herself a lot. If you're gonna ask me to get down strip naked, I will do it. That's just how I am. Well, but the thing is, like, my parents kind of have a thing with that, so I mean, I don't know if I would go against my parents or not. I, hey. I'm not sure. She, she also tries to start a conversation about Asian representation, which is commendable. I think that there's just not enough Asian models out there. I feel that I can break down that barrier, and I think it's my responsibility. But it goes about as poorly as it could. I'm not into Asian guys. 
Why not? The thing is, they're a lot shorter than I am, which is something that I can't tolerate. Like, you know Gina wasn't putting her best foot forward because when she does ultimately get picked for the house, she starts screaming this. Gina! Oh my god! <laughs> I'm on Asian man, I swear to god, I do not do that! If the purpose of these castings were to find the best contestants, Gina clearly would not have made it into the house, but of course they are not. They're to try and cast the best show possible, and Gina was obviously never going to win, but I feel like the producers were banking on her putting her foot in her mouth and not being able to defend herself very well, and in that sense, mission accomplished. We have a lot of girls left to get through, so in the interest of time, I'm going to group the next few together because they all kind of play the same role. So let's now discuss Molly Sue, Leslie, and the girl we skipped earlier, Carrie. And these girls belong to a group of contestants that every season of the show has that I will refer to as Elimination Fodder. With the way that storylines work on this show, girls stay on until their story reaches its conclusion, at which point they are eliminated. But sometimes there are weeks where no girl has a story reach its natural conclusion, and that's what these ladies are for. Molly. Fierce. What about her personality? She seems robotic. I'm Molly. I'm 25. I'm from Tampa. Elimination fodder girls don't really have storylines. They're just kind of there so the producers always have someone around that they can cleanly dispose of if the need ever arises. This is not to say that these girls are bad models. I actually think that Molly Sue is technically the most successful person to come out of this cast with regard to modeling in the real world. But I'm also not invested enough to look it up. But I think, I think she did pretty well for herself. I also don't think it's the case that these girls can't potentially win the show. Like, I have a theory that Nicole, who won Cycle 5, was originally cast for the purpose of being elimination fodder, but then the girl that the producers meant to be the winner of the show, who was named Lisa, uh, she put on an adult diaper and soiled herself uh, while on set at a photo shoot in an effort to impress Steve-O and Wee Man from, from the Jackass franchise. Uh, and then when the producers found out about that, they like silently eliminated her for no reason. And that threw off the plans that they had, allowing Nicole to kind of rise to the top and win. Yeah, everything, that's real what I just said. Everything I, I said, that actually happened. Whatever the case may be, though, these girls are the ones that the producers never bothered giving storylines to, which I think puts them at a disadvantage, and it definitely makes them kind of forgettable. She seems robotic. Of course, sometimes an elimination fodder girl can be so undeniably awesome that she gets given a storyline midway through the show, which is the case with the next girl, Joni. Joni is a girl that the show doesn't pay much attention to for a very long time. Like, even Tyra says that she thought Joni was gonna get eliminated and until she saw her photo. This girl shocked me. In front of me, I was just like, no, send her home. I don't even think she should be in the 20 finalists. Then I see this photo and I'm like, that's a model. In casting, they talk about how Joni is a preacher's daughter who uh, eventually went on to do amateur nights at a strip club. Um, and I think that what happened was that the show thought that she would be a much bigger wild child than she actually turned out to be. Like, she's very level-headed and, and kind of has a good sense of humor about it. The Lord is the only one that can judge me. So, like, yeah, the show was like, fuck you, you're, you're too stable. I don't, I don't care about you anymore. Eventually, though, she just keeps rocking it and taking some of the best photos of the show's ever Scenes, so the producers decided to give her a storyline midway through, and eventually she makes it to the final two. Uh, for those of you wondering, her storyline is that she has a snaggle tooth, and it somehow makes for some very riveting television. But, like, I'm not even joking, I cried. Another girl who kind of seems like she was supposed to be elimination fodder was Brooke, although I think Brooke might also... Uh, fit into this archetype that the show likes to do every season, which is the girl who doesn't know that she's beautiful, d despite the fact that she auditioned for a modeling competition. 
One of the most popular contestants of all time was this girl named Shandy from Cycle 2, who was like the real world version of that trope in movies where a girl takes off her glasses and suddenly she's gorgeous. Uh, and ever since then, it always seems like they're kind of trying to recapture that magic by casting at least one kind of awkward girl with a clear anxiety disorder. And I get the sense that that's what they're trying to do with Brooke based on how they introduce her as being, you know, not like the other girls. <laughs> I'm more of a hippie. I don't wear makeup. I don't brush my hair. I barefoot all the time. So tell me why you love airplane food so much. It tastes really, really good. That said, they do a fun little twist on their formula with Brooke, which is that in their road to trying to get her to realize how beautiful she truly is, they they keep telling her that she's not she's not beautiful. Like obviously they don't say it outright, but they keep saying stuff like this. I love her face too. It's a face that is very difficult for the public to understand. But you know, I, I probably wouldn't want to hear that said about about my face. The next girl we meet is Danielle. And uh, if Sarah's storyline is she's the girl who's not sure that she wants it, Danielle is the girl who knows that she wants it and she will kill you and your entire family to get it. I am starving. There is no if, ands, and buts about it. There is no going home for me. I did not come all the way from little bitty Little Rock, Arkansas to get turned around and go home. That's not an option. I'm hella focused right now. Like, seriously, the first two seconds of the season is the show juxtaposing these two girls, I think, to show you just how badly Danielle wants to win. My name's Sarah. I've never done any modeling or anything, but I say I have a good shot at it, maybe. <laughs> My name is Danielle. Like, I need to get in that house, and I'm not going to rest, and I'm not going to stop until I do that. Spoilers for this season, I guess. Uh, Danielle is ultimately the girl who wins, and I think she's my favorite winner ever. Like, she's really cool, she's this fun personality, she takes great pictures and all that jazz, but that said, I feel like even if she sucked really bad, she would still probably have won because, like, if she didn't win this season, I think she could have a legitimate lawsuit against the show just based on all the shit that she went through to get to the finale. Danielle establishes herself early on as the girl who's going to do whatever it takes to win and not complain about it. And like, the show really takes that and runs with it. And I know in this industry, you got to have tough skin. And like, I got gator skin without the bumps. Over the course of the season, she sprains her ankle. She's subjected to unwanted cosmetic surgery. She, she almost dies of food poisoning in Thailand before ripping out her IV and trekking through the jungle to go pose on an elephant. I, I, th I think there's more, but my point is that she goes through a lot at the show's expense. Kind of the entire season is just watching Danielle put up with more and more shit in a way that would like be cartoonish if it wasn't happening to a real woman who's kind of suffering for the purposes of our entertainment. But whatever, she wins. It works out. Everyone's fine. My conscience is clean. After Danielle, we meet Kathy, who's one of the most fully fleshed out personalities of anyone on this season. Uh, she's painted as this small town girl who's never been to the big city, and it's like genuinely very joyful watching that play out. Goodness. My goodness! My goodness! <laughs> Guys, you have a happy hillbilly. Uh, she says she's never been dancing, so we get to watch her dance. Uh, she gets to fly on a plane for the first time, and, and she's really excited about that. Because they always say that people look like little ants when you're up there. And they do! Uh, she makes silly mistakes, like when she's told to, to change and she just strips naked in front of everyone. Whoa, 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 whoa. Whoa. Hey, hey, girl, I don't need to see your butt here. Go inside. Down. That's right. <laughs> Sorry. Whoops. She calls herself a hillbilly, and yes, there's a chance she might be playing it up for the camera just a little bit. I'm going to Los Angeles, and I'm going to get a swim in a cement pond. But, but re-watching this first episode, I fell in love with Kathy, and she became one of my favorite contestants, like, ever on the show. Yeah, she gets eliminated first.
The show spends a lot of time on Kathy, and I think it's because they know she's going home early. Like, she's just this, like, fun girl who's happy to be along for the ride, so they highlight her early on to give us a good show while they kind of buffer the rest of the contestants and collect their thoughts on what they're going to say about them because they'll be around longer, you know? I don't know. R.I.P. though, because she's honestly just great. What? I'm, I'm definitely going to use that clip a lot going forward. The last contestant that we meet is Nena, and it is at this moment that I will take a moment to tell you guys that there are a lot of parts of the show that maybe aren't the best things for me to be talking about as a probably cis white man. Uh, I will do my best to avoid covering these topics whenever possible, but I don't think I could in this case. And if for some reason I do end up putting my foot in my mouth, please let me know in the comments and I will do my best to learn and do better. Okay, so back to Nena. Nena's storyline seems to be that she's African and, and it really rubs me the wrong way. Oh, balls, that sounded way worse. Let me explain. The show does a lot of work in establishing that Nena is from Nigeria. Like, Nena herself introduces herself as being from Texas, but Tyra immediately stops her and says this. Right, but you have an accent, so where are you originally from? Tyra then compares her to the supermodel Iman, which, you know, I don't see, but she does it a lot, and she probably knows better than me. Uh, and then she says this, just to make sure that we know that she is, in fact, from from Nigeria. You're an American citizen. Yes, I am. With a Nigerian flavor. Like, the show really wants you to know that Nena is from Africa. Like, take a look at this clip. I feel like the fashion industry is in love with and obsessed with girls from Africa. This is Eddie Murphy and Iman's baby. It is coming to America. And I cannot express enough how I did not edit that clip in any way. And right now you might be expecting me to say something like they're terrible to Nena because she's from Nigeria, but that's not actually the case. Like if you were to just watch the first two episodes, you would probably think that Nena was absolutely going to win the show because the show, they love Nena, but like they also don't love Nena. Like they love the idea of Nena. I think Nena is definitely done the dirtiest by the way the show shades its contestants down to these simple storylines because they do what I think a lot of well-meaning Americans do to immigrants, which is that they become so enamored with the idea of all she's been through and all the struggle and how she survived that they never actually give her a chance to be a real person. Like, I actually think that Nena is kind of a jerk, but I also think that she has a right to be kind of a jerk and the show doesn't really grant her that luxury. Like, it just kind of treats Nena like she's this perfect divine goddess right up top and then slowly learns that she's an actual person who exists outside of their desire to like mine her for tragedy. And once that happens, they kind of just like lose interest in her and, and she's eliminated. I think it's actually a pretty good unintentional metaphor that the show kind of starts to turn on Nena when she does this photo shoot where she's supposed to portray this baby doll and it looks like completely so uncomfortable on her. The show completely infantilizes Nena in a way that's completely unfair and I don't have much else to say about it other than I think that it's icky and, and should be called out. But yeah, other than that, Nena kind of sucks though. She's not, she's not my favorite contestant. All right, so that's all the girls who make it to the house. The rest of the episode is just a bunch of weird challenges that aren't worth really talking about. And along the way, you meet some other fun characters like the girl who misses her family a lot, the emergency room doctor who wants to become a modeling contestant, and then there are like the common stock characters that you get in every single reality show, like the dinosaur and the Dracula. My name is Dracula. Um, let me see, did I miss anything? Uh, there's one girl named Danny who I don't really remember very much. Let's see, let's see what she's all about. My name is Danny, and I want to be a model. My entire life has been a dream. And I cheerlead football games, and I have so many friends. She seems 
Nice. I wonder why she didn't make it into the house. It was like 95% black girls. It was all black girls. Really? I didn't realize it was going to be like that. One thing, I don't believe in affirmative action. It's like the biggest load of crap I've ever heard in my whole life. Why would I go apply for a job at like some FUBU retail whatever? All right, so, so let's talk about her for a second, shall we? So as you can see, that colorful character's name is Danny, and I think Gina said it best when she said this. Danny is, is perhaps best summed up by this other contestant's testimonial in what is probably my favorite quote of the episode. Danny ends up always coming across racist, which she says she's not, but everyone swears she just because she always is saying racist remarks. She's horrible. I, I, don't, I don't have much else to say about that. She really sucks. But said in the show's defense, like, I think they know she sucks. Like, you don't get the sense that the people making the show are ever really on her side. But then again, like, this was her audition tape. I don't like gay people. I don't like Muslims. I don't like abortions. I don't like anything liberal. But other than that, I really like to get along with people. And the producers were still like, yeah, let's see how this one pans out. Like, Danny was clearly just brought on for the drama, which is regrettable. Like, don't get me wrong, I love watching two hot girls fight as much as the next guy, but uh, there's a huge difference between watching a girl pretend to pee on someone's bed because she wants it for herself, and watching a woman of color defend herself from a bigot. I know how I feel, and you don't. So you can't tell me that I'm racist when I know I'm not. That's a, that's a solid argument, Danny. I'm thankfully, no, nobody would ever, ever say anything like that today. My favorite part about Danny is that when she makes it into the casting, the judges clearly don't like her, and they basically tell her that she's going to be working with a lot of gay people in the business of fashion, and she unironically makes this argument as to why they should be more tolerant about her being horrible. It feels like they should have a more open mind as to what I was born in, what I was raised in. You can't choose where you come from. Cause like, yeah, yeah, she was, she was born this way, guys. And again, this is 2006 and she's like 12 here. So there's a good chance that she's realized the error of her ways and grown a lot. Um, but that said, there's also like a solid chance that she was one of the people who raided the Capitol and there's really no way of knowing. Danny makes up the bulk of the story of this episode and I feel like I probably could have just ignored her but I didn't want to do that one because she was just too insane not to talk about and two because I did want to let you guys know that when I say this show is problematic I'm not whistling Dixie like that's actually true and th things things will happen and you should know what you're getting into. But yeah, that's all the girls who are worth knowing about this season. Um, but I could, of course, not in good conscience finish this video without mentioning the only person who actually matters in the world of top model. And that is one Miss Tyrolyn Banks, or Banks with an X, as her Wikipedia says that she's called. Even though, like, I've been to a lot of forums and stuff and, like, I've never, I've never heard that. Believe me when I tell you that in the world of top model, Tyra Banks is a god. And I don't mean like, oh, everyone looks up to her kind of god. I mean, I genuinely think that the contestants would sacrifice a goat to her if it meant getting through to the next round. Every moment that she's on screen is an event. Like, she'll bust through the door and music will play and everyone will just dance around and be happy because she's just that important. If she's not on screen, then her presence is still felt. Like the goal of the show is to please Tyra. So a lot of the contestants spend their time saying like, oh, I hope Tyra's happy or I hope I made Tyra proud or I hope Tyra does, doesn't smite me. Whenever Tyra. not on screen, all the other characters should be asking, where's Tyra? Like it's kind of like Catholicism but, but if Jesus was super hot. Just look at the first time we see her this season. She does this weird fake out where she says that she's not gonna be at casting through like a weird video message and they cut to the girls looking like someone just told them that their mom and Santa Claus did a murder-suicide to each other. 
But then surprise, it turns out that she was there all along and everyone's happy. My favorite part of this is that the producers know that what's going on isn't really all that exciting, but since Tyra's existence always has to be this huge event, they just like cut to this girl excitedly explaining how doors work. All of a sudden she comes out of the door like, ah! And if you don't believe me about how godlike the show portrays her, look at this clip of the contestants copying her twerking and tell me that this doesn't look like something out of a cult. That, that is ultimate power right there. And you know, for what it's worth, I actually think Tyra has kind of earned the right to be treated this way. Okay, maybe she shouldn't be treated like a god, but I really do respect her in a lot of ways. First and foremost, because I genuinely do believe that she is one of the smartest people on earth to have ever lived. Like, Tyra Banks got to where she is by being hot, sure but more than that it was by knowing what she was doing and why she was doing it at all times like we take for granted that she's this huge superstar but the fact of the matter is hot or not she broke a lot of barriers for models of color and her meteoric rise to ubiquity was not the sure thing that we think of it today i think tyra would probably be successful in whatever field she chose even if she looked like well, me, because she clearly spends a lot of time studying what she's doing and learning everything she can about it. Like, the modeling world is not the most complex thing in the world, but Tyra knows it like the back of her hand, which I'm sure is, is very soft and well moisturized. She does do stuff like tell the girls to watch their weight or warn them that the race they're presenting might make it harder for them, and it doesn't age well, but I also don't think that she's wrong in saying that those things are probably legitimate concerns for someone working in the fashion industry. Like, it's certainly stuff that Tyra herself has had to deal with, and she probably got it way worse because there weren't cameras around for her. So yeah, while the world of Top Model is definitely evil and and messed up, I think that's mostly because it's a reflection of a real world that's evil and messed up. But like, at least the world of Top Model is filtered through the eyes of someone who seems to have managed to make sense out of all the evil and mess up in this of that world. And you know, not for nothing, but the show is also ahead of its time in a lot of ways. Like, it has some of the most diverse casts of any show ever and it featured some of the queerest people on earth as judges and mentors long before stuff like that was considered mainstream hell even gina's attempt to start a discussion about asian representation while oh my god i love asian men i swear to god i do not like you know, I do regrettable was probably not something you'd likely see on a lot of other tv shows at the time and look i don't really know if tyra really has all the answers but she's sure managed to create a world where it seems like she does and maybe that's why i decided to go back to the world of top model when things got really really difficult for me because yes it's problematic yes it's dated yes i feel like i'm probably going to hell just by associating myself with it but more than anything it's simple I am at a place in my life, as a lot of us are, where everything feels jumbled and my future feels like this big confusing mess that hangs over my head. It's coming at me too quick and it's lingering on the horizon, taunting me like the little bitch boy that I am. And more than anything, I just want answers. My therapist was talking to me about the other day about the possibility of me having OCD and one of the questions he asked me was about God and I said I probably didn't apply to me because I don't know how big a role God plays in my life and he said maybe that means it super applies to me and I said well shit man, damn. A lot of my anxieties these days are based on the fact that I have no clue what the future holds for me and that's really, really scary. Like I'm looking for a sense of control or some feeling of certainty that doesn't really exist in the world because the world is complex and unknowable and, and, and messy. When I was a kid going to my little Catholic classes every Wednesday afternoon, I had answers. I knew that if I did this, it would lead to this, 
and this, and then as long as I don't touch myself, it would all lead to God. It wasn't fun, but at the very least, I could be certain in it. Then one day, for whatever reason, I lost that certainty, and it probably left a much bigger void in me than I even realized. The world of Top Model is different, though. People are boiled down to simple storylines, and their goals are laid out for them by a higher power, and ultimately, all you need to do is make yourself seem right in the eyes of one single, all-knowing, majestic being. And believe me, when I jokingly compared Tyra to God earlier in the script, I didn't know I would be taking it quite this far, but here we are, because not only is she a lot like a god in this world, but she's a God who really speaks to me. Maybe that's why I wanted to make this video series too, because I guess consider this me spreading the good word of, of Tyra. So that's my video. Uh, I guess if you liked it, please like and subscribe. I'm, I'm really bad about asking people to do that. Um, and I'll be honest, this video kind of kicked my ass. Uh, to make both because I've never done anything like it before and I'm um, not always in the best headspace emotionally these days but hopefully it turned out decently and I, th I think I'll, I'll get better with the next one um, I had to cut out a lot of the stuff I wanted to say just to make this one make sense but hopefully that's what the next episode is for and I look forward to seeing what other weird turns I take 